Bien, buenos días. Vamos a dar inicio a la tercera intimada conferencia internacional de ingeniería eléctrica a ciencias computacionales y control automático CCE 2024. Eh, bien, buen día, bienvenido a todos. Eh, debido a que en la conferencia es internacional tenemos gente en línea también. Eh, otros asistentes están por llegar, pero el idioma oficial de la conferencia es en inglés, entonces vamos a continuar en inglés. So, welcome everyone to this uh, uh, 2024, uh, 21st International Conference on Analytic Engineering, Computer Science and Automatic Control, CC 2024, uh, here at CIPA Staff in Mexico City. Uh, uh, If you have hit in, in, uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering, it's in the staff, Centro de Investigación de Estudios Avanzados del Instituto Politécnico Nacional, uh, Center for Research, uh, Advanced Studies of the National Protein Institute. Uh, this conference is sponsored by the IEEE, uh, uh, by the Electron Devices Society uh, Chapter, And, and also uh, sponsored by the Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society, uh, a student chapter, a new student chapter from the IEEE. Uh, okay. Uh, Next. Next. So, welcome to actors, attendees, colleagues, students, personal visitors. Uh, we would like to, to give you a very warm welcome to this CC 2024. We wish you a good, satisfying, and successful conference. And, and, and this, this year we are celebrating the, the 21st International Conference on Electric Engineering, Computer Science and Automatic Control. CCE 2024, whose organization here at CIPDA staff is possible with the collaboration of the Department of Electric Engineering, the Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, uh, multidisciplinary program here at CIPDA staff, also CIPDA staff Guadalajara, and other institutions like the, the, the National Polytechnic Institute, Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Escaposalco, Universidad de las Américas en Puebla, Universidad Aeronáutica de Querétaro, Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí, etc. The conference deals with different research areas uh, related with electrical engineering, computer science, and automatic control, as well as other research and technological topics uh, as uh, mechanical engineering, aerospace, uh, aerial vehicles, and so on. Uh, this, this, this year, this CC 2024 is again following a hybrid format that is uh, an in-person uh, in person physical conference and also an online conference. Uh, so the, the, the CC 2024 is a is an online and a, a virtual conference for people in other cities and countries. The, again, the registration fee is also free for any chairs for authors and attendees. And, and, and the final list of articles to be published in the IEEE Explorer will consist only with those papers which is again being formally presented uh, at the conference. Uh, so, uh, This, this year, this year, the CCE 2024 received 166 uh, submissions from 18 different countries, from which uh, 113, that is uh, uh, 68% of them have been accepted for presentation and publication at the conference. Uh, the opening event, the plenary conference, the technical sessions will be held, held in person and also online using our facilities and institutional platform on Microsoft Teams. And we want, we want to thank to all the keynote speakers. Uh, thank you uh, to accept the invitation uh, to share uh, uh, the research and, and, 
and experience to the conference, also to authors of the papers, to the program chairs, uh, to the many anonymous reviewers, and also the technical staff for the hard work and support to the conference. So this year we have uh, six uh, keynote speakers. Uh, uh, and we will start with uh, the, with Professor Carlos Ocampo Martinez, who will uh, talk about the event driven partitioning for non central risk prediction control in economic dispatch of interconnected microgrids. Professor Carlos Ocampo Martinez is professor in the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya uh, in, in Barcelona, Spain. So uh, this will be the, 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 the first uh, plenary lecture. And, and then uh, the, the next uh, keynote speaker is Professor Spireta Golemate. Thank you for coming, for accepting the invitation. Uh, she will uh, talk about exploring cardiovascular mechanics with uh, ultrasound. He's coming from the National Incapodistrian University of Athens, uh, in Athens, Greece. And it's important to mention that uh, she is an IEEE distinguished lecturer who accepted the invitation by the IEEE uh, uh, Engineering and Medicine Biology Society, the new uh, to the chapter here in Simbestab. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for helping to the, the student chapter. Uh, the, and tomorrow, tomorrow, the, the first uh, uh, plenary lecture will be given by Professor Jorge Poveda. Uh, we'll talk about prescribed time stability in switch systems with resets, a hybrid dynamical system approach. Professor Jorge Poveda received uh, the, the, the Donald Ekman uh, uh, Prize in in USA, that's an important price uh, in the IEEE and the automatic culture community. Uh, he will take, he will give um, an interesting talk. He's professor in electrical and computer engineering at uh, the department of the department at the University of California in San Diego, USA. Uh, the, the the next uh, keynote speaker also tomorrow. Uh, is by uh, Dr. Kevin McComber. We'll talk about empowering semiconductor innovation, cultivating technology and education through photonics. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kevin McComber is CEO, CIO uh, in Spark Photonics and founder and executive, executive director in the Spark Photonics Foundation from Waltham, uh, Massachusetts, USA. Uh, and, and the in the next Friday, the the next uh, keynote speaker will be Professor David Estrada, from who is professor of material science and engineering at the Boise State University and co-founder of Inflex Labs from Boise, Idaho, USA. He will talk about building the future of printed electronic based on one D and two D semiconductors. Uh, after, after that, the, the final keynote speaker will, will be uh, Dr. Aníbal Pacheco, who is a senior postdoctoral research in the Pervasive Electronics Advanced Research Laboratory in the Universidad de Granada in Spain. He will talk about radio frequency circuits with unstructured material based devices and their compact modeling. So, one important topic in the, uh, uh, of the conference will be the semiconductors, the the new advance, advance, advances in electronics here in Mexico City and also in other countries. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor and Dr. Areli Cano, for your help in the conference, inviting these uh, interesting speakers. And the conference also consists with a research in the in development conference, uh, who will be who will be given by the through the company uh, New World. So uh, today we will have uh, two uh, R and D conference: this electrification, uh, AC to DC transition, and also an, 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 a, di a different talk of fundamentals of oscilloscopes and analysis in embedded system by Jose de Jesus Rodriguez from Electronics Newer Companies here in Mexico City. Uh, the next uh, R and D conference. Uh, 
uh, the next two uh, R and D conference will be given by Jesus Ruben Santa Ana Samudio. This uh, will be two workshops, practical work workshops. The first one on building an IoT device with Raspberry Pi Pi code W, and the other getting a start for Raspberry Pi 5 with the AI kit. Uh, Jesus Ruben Santa Ana Samudio is from Raspberry Pi Kit Factory here in Mexico City. He, he will give uh, two workshops, practical workshops for our students, uh, for any attendee. Okay, the technical program, the technical program uh, consists uh, in 11 topics. Uh, they will be uh, divided, they will be organized in, in four uh, parallel rooms. Uh, this is the, the room four and, and over there are other three rooms. So the, the, the topics of the conference are automatic control, biomedical engineering, biomimetics, also computer science and computer engineering, communication systems, uh, communications systems, mechatronics, mechanical engineering, nanotechnology, materials and applications, power electronics, also solid state materials, uh, electronic devices and integrated circuits, Aeronautic, aeronautics and aerospace engineering, and also autonomous navigation uh, in area vehicles. So, uh, 11 topics. Uh, uh, the program chairs uh, of this conference were, uh, first of all, we, we want to thank to all of the program chairs uh, who made an important role, uh, hard work. Uh, by reviewing, uh, taking care of the manuscript papers submitted to the conference and helping to the final decisions. So first of all, thank you to Dr. Areli Cano Martinez, who is uh, a colleague here in the in Department of Electric and Engineering in the CIS Solid State Electronics section. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you to Dr. Blanca Tobacco Corona from Lupita IPN. Who, take, uh, who, who, who was uh, in care of the biomedical Engineering, also to Dr. Elsa Velasquez Miranda from, from the Universidad de las Americas in Puebla, who was uh, in, in who was in the mechanical engineering uh, topic. Dr. Ernesto Mellano, a colleague from Simesta Guadalajara, who, who helped us uh, with the computer science and computer engineering. Our colleague, uh, Dr. Mauricio Lara Barron, here from the Department of Political Engineering. He, 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 he helped us uh, in the communication system, systems topic. Also, to our colleague from the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, Dr. Francisco Gran Carvajal, who helped us in the automatic control topic. Dr. Juan Fernando Pesa Solís from the IPN uh, in Mechatronics. Dr. Oscar Alejandro García Pérez from the Universidad Aeronáutica de Querétaro uh, in the topic Aeronautics and Aerospace Engineering and Autonomous Navigations. Dr. Ricardo Álvarez Salas from the Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí, de San Luis Potosí. He, he was in the topic Power Electronics. And finally, to Dr. Salvador Gallardo Hernández, a colleague here from Cinestar Zacateco, who helped us in the nanotechnology materials and applications. Thank you very much for your contribution, for your help to the conference, to the to guarantee the quality to the of the conference uh, of the research topics. And as I said, uh, also we have our research and development conference and also uh, exposition stands uh, provided by NIGWAR, uh, an ABNET company, uh, through the ingeniero Jonathan Mesa Ramirez. Uh, NIGWAR represents to NIGWAR, Omega, Raspberry Pi Foundation, Tectronics, Weather, and and we expect to, to have uh, different stands with uh, kits from Raspberry and other uh, components like uh, uh, multimeters, oscilloscopes, uh, and so on, uh, uh, with low cost uh, equipment to acquire here. Uh, we will have a, a, in, on Friday, we will have a memorial session. Uh, in order to have a ceremony in honor and memory of two of our colleagues, Professor Dr. Jose Antonio Moreno Cadenas and, and Professor Dr. Gesitlav Eliukin, uh, our colleagues from the solid state electronics section uh, 
uh, we'll organize uh, uh, one ceremony, uh, one uh, memorial session uh, uh, as part of the conference. Uh, so Professor Jose Antonio Moreno was an, uh, uh, the persistent uh, attendee of the conference. The, he was, uh, was also uh, uh, every year promoting the continuation of this conference and one of the decano of, of here of the Department of Electrical Engineering. And uh, two weeks ago, Professor Dr. Yashitane Yukin uh, passed away and, and uh, after 25 years here at Simvestav. Uh, okay. Uh, some final remarks, the organizing committee wishes to thank the anonymous reference and also the support and staff for their valuable time and efforts, which have made possible a successful CCE 2024. Our special thanks for the valuable help and support to our institution, Simvestav, also to the IEEE for the sponsorship uh, uh, for the IEEE Explorer platform. Also to the IEEE Electron Devices Society to make possible the registration of this conference at the IEEE. And a, a new uh, also to the IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society uh, via a new student chapter. Thank you for your cooperation. And finally, to the International Program Committee and to all the members of the International Program Committee, to our colleagues, to our students, to the personnel, to the staff. Thank you very much for your contributions and your support to the conference. Sincerely, uh, uh, here, uh, myself, Gerardo Silva Navarro. And uh, pues, finally, let's start the CCE 2024. Thank you for coming. Thank you to continue this conference. And we expect the best uh, for all of you uh, this week, these three days. Thank you very much. And we declare to open the conference. Thank you. So the, the, the next activity of the conference will be the first plenary lecture. Professor Carlos Ocampo Martínez is already there in Barcelona, Spain. And Professor Francisco Beltrán will be the, the session chair of this uh, plenary lecture. Doctor Barcelona and Carlos, can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Hello. Oh, oh, hi, Carlos. Uh, good, good morning in Mexico City. Good afternoon in Barcelona, Spain. It is a great honor for me to introduce our first. First keynote speaker, Dr. Carlos Ocampo Martinez from the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, UPC. Professor Carlos Ocampo Martinez is a great leader in several fields of automatic control. He received his doctoral degree in control engineering from the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, Barcelona, Spain, in 2007. In 2007 and 2008, he held a postdoctoral position at the ARC Center of Complex Dynamic Systems and Control in the University of Newcastle in Australia, afterwards at the Spanish National Research Council in the Institute of Robotics and Industrial Informatics at UPC, as a Juan de la Sierra Research Fellow. Since 2011, he has been with the Automatic Control Department at the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya as an associated professor in automatic control and model predictive control. He spent visiting periods at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in USA, the University of, of Delft in the Netherlands, the University of Cambridge in the UK, the University of Siena in Italy, 
and at the Instituto Tecnológico de Buenos Aires in Argentina. His main research interests include constraints in model predictive control, large scale system management, process control, and industrial application, mainly related to the scopes of water and energy and smart manufacturing under the IoT framework. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Carlos Ocampo Martinez with the plenary lecture, Event Treatment Partitioning for No Centralized Predictive Control in Economic Dispatch of Interconnected Systems. Yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Please confirm that uh, you are able to, to see my screen. Mm. Okay. Are you able to see my screen right now? Yes. 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 Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this nice event. Uh, today, my, I have the pleasure of introducing this topic, something that is a mixture of several to uh, tools, several themes within the automatic control uh, topics uh, framework. In this case, uh, this talk, uh, after your nice presentation, Francisco, thank you so much. My 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 talk was inspired by conversation, by very, very interesting conversations with my former student, Wichak Ananduta, this guy from Indonesia. Uh, I had the, the privilege, the pleasure of working with him, very, very smart guy. Uh, and uh, he he received the uh, doctoral uh, degree in uh, 2019 from our university here in Barcelona. He was uh, he was yeah acting as a researcher as a very focused researcher on control in electric networks. Given that we had at that time an interesting project, European project with the um, aim of improving the way of managing different energy networks. You can imagine there are tons of discussions, tons of uh, papers, books talking about the area, talking about the problem. But with WeChat, we were thinking about the possibility of doing some contribution, some doing something different in this kind of system from the point of view of automatic control and exploiting different aspects from this uh, interesting uh, system or for this interesting problem as a, as a, as a whole, as a, yeah. Then we had this, we have something that perhaps you can imagine in energy and nowadays the, uh, it, it is quite in the fashion that you are talking about grids, electric grids, microgrids, energy communities, Tons of topics, several topics that you perhaps intuitively understand, but in some sense you don't know how you could manage them in a smart way, given the particular features of the new technology that you should cope with and the different problems, different uh, scenarios for working with these kind of systems. Notice that, for instance, in this scheme that you have in, in, in front of you in this slide, uh, you could think about these energy systems right now uh, from the point of view of a local local device, for instance, the electrolyzer, given, given that they are devices that produce energy, so you are, they are able to consume and produce because we, we should take into consideration different loads you can have. Notice that in general, you can put houses or buildings as loads of this kind of systems. But notice that here you have cars or buses or other, other, other nature of, of loads sensible to be part of this kind of systems. And then you can think about them, as I, I previously said, from the point of view of local devices and then from the point of view of a, a grid or a network, a local network where those devices are connected and where you 
you perform this exchange of different energy vectors. And then you can think about this microgrid or energy community right now is the, is the, is the suitable term for defining this kind of arrays uh, as a part of different microgrids or co energy communities interconnected and all of them connected to the electrical grid, which is the traditional way of supplying energy to the different uh, uh, different stamens, different devices connected to the different networks. So this was our our goal. Okay, we we know this this system, we know this scheme. This is not new from the point of view of the way of connecting them, uh, not only from the for the bottom of the of the concept given the device from the medium part of the the the, the, the mid layer that is the, the set of devices interconnected and suitably uh, managed. And then the way of connecting all of them to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the rest of potential microgrids. So we said, okay, fantastic. We know about optimization-based control, something that is, is, according to the literature, quite suitable for attacking these kind of problems. Then we know that the systems, given this description, they are multi-layer, they have different dynamics of different speed, Therefore, you have different time constants. You should play with it with them, and therefore you should create something smart in order to go, to to manage, or, or in order to to say, okay, this is something new that we can do with the with the management of the systems. We know that the in the in the way of managing the system, you have different objectives. Therefore, if you if you think about optimization based control, you know that you have behind the, the design of the control strategy, you have a multi-objective problem. Therefore, you should include in this multi-objective problem different, or as the name says, you merge, you gather different objectives. Therefore, there is a challenge about the way of, st uh, of about the way of um, state the problem. So this is not, this is not trivial. Uh, mainly the nature of every single device is quite different. Therefore, you should consider together with the multi-rate topology that you are not able to say, okay, I do something particular for a fuel cell and you can apply the same regime of control, let's say, with an electrolyzer, with a solar energy panels or whatever you want to, to say here in this ecosystem or system of systems. And therefore you should you, you should consider this feature of, of heterogeneity, heterogeneity. Then, notice that right now, in contrast with the previous um, policy of, okay, if I need energy, I connect my system to the grid, to the grid, electrical grid, and this electrical grid in general could be, or this energy could be produced by uh, the uh, hydropower systems or by other uh, nuclear systems or thermodynamical systems, whatever. Now we are considering, given the sustainability, the concept of sustainability and the uh, climate change or so on, we, we, we want to prioritize the way of spending, the way of the way of taking energy from non-renewable sources. Therefore, the concept of green energy appears. And if you're interested in prioritize this energy and uh, try to avoid the use of uh, other fuels based on petroleum or other that is non-renewable. Another feature is, okay, I know that I have a system, but I, you sh I, I should take into account that the way of managing the system is not from the point of view, not mainly from the point of view of the device, something that is, of course, a must, because you should have the device under control uh, prior of saying, OK, I know how to uh, create a global policy of management. So I should take into consideration that you are talking about money, you are talking about sustainability, you are talking about availability of the resource. So you should take, you, you should think about the energy, dynamical energy dispatch problem, something that is uh, and it, uh, has a huge economic point of view. And then related to this point is the energy trading versus the energy management. Notice that from the control point of view, perhaps you can say, okay, for me, the main, the main objective is to, 
to, to improve the robustness, okay, the stability, performance, and robustness of the devices. But from the economical point of view, you say, okay, fantastic. For uh, yeah, I, I know that engineers are in charge of controlling the robustness properties and capabilities. But I, I want to have the clear numbers and the my investment in these infrastructures and in these policies should be should be clear from the point of view of gains. So th this is at the end the final goal. Okay, so. Notice the, the the picture we we were talking about. We were thinking and talking together with WeChat in the possibility of saying, okay, what is the what what could be a way of contributing to this point to this to this framework, and then okay, our motivation was or, or, or the first thing was okay, let us think about particular questions. Okay. Let's say what can be considered, or, or, or how we can consider these kind of systems as large-scale systems, and that we said, okay, well, this is natural. In, in the from the point of view of gathering different devices, and then the devices are gathered as microgrids or uh, energy communities, and then you get all the mold, and then you have a huge system of systems where every single node is a microgrid. So you have a large scale system and then you should be scalar and, and the, modula, the modularity should be present. Therefore, you in, in, in the, from this point of view, you can say, OK, this is a large scale system. Given our expertise, our previous experience in control, and in my case, in other topics such as uh, water and not in particular in energy, uh, we were thinking, OK, fantastic, why don't we exploit the capabilities of optimization-based controllers, and if possible, with predictive capabilities. Notice that I don't want to talk about model predictive control because model predictive control was a very appealing topic in the previous years. However, MPC is something risky when you start thinking about its application. I have been lecturer of MPC during more than 15 years here at the university. And I realized that MPC, no matter it is wonderful, it's a nice uh, area of research, it has different uh, drawbacks depending on the application area. So we were a little bit scared about saying, no, MPC, this is our, this is our um, way, this is our opportunity. So the question was, on the contrary, is MPC really suitable? Given the previous um, framework of uh, given by the features of this kind of systems, right? Another question was how to manage MPC and large scale system. Everybody knows that behind the MPC, the the, the uh, predictive controllers, there is an optimization problem, and this only depending on the size of this optimization problem, and depending on the dimension of the system, perhaps. The optimization problem could be huge and unfeasible to be solved from the from the computational point of view. Therefore, we need to think in a smart way of applying MPC and combine MPC with large scale systems. <laughs> Remember that we are facing a real system. Therefore, the system, given the real nature, it has higher end constraints given by operational policies, given by physical limits of the devices, and given by another thing that is very important in the way of stating the problem. In energy, you should provide energy to a client, a, a, a customer. Therefore, the customer is something that could be considered as a stochastic process. When you don't know how or where you don't know how the, the temporal evolution of this consumption of this load would be. Therefore, you need to face a pure disturbance rejection problem. You don't have any uh, reference set point. No, you need to reject the disturbance given by the consumption of energy and given by the production of energy from renewable renewables and some of some kind of renewable sources. So imagine wind, imagine solar energy or, or perhaps uh, geothermal energy where you say, okay, now the production is okay, is regular given some parameters, but sometimes, okay, the day is cloudy, solar radiation is poor, therefore the way of producing energy is not certain, so you have uncertainty. 
Okay, so a part of this distorted rejection problem, a part of taking into account the constraints of the system, you should take in, into consideration other appealing as well, appealing uh, objectives, policies, uh, ways of managing, which are related to some very specific and important aspects of the society. For instance, carbon footprint reduction, resiliency, um, what else, the uh, environmental issues. So a part of thinking on economical gains on the way of uh, managing the system from the device point of view, you should combine the, the these objectives or this nature of objectives with these other uh, more societal and specific and environmental objectives. Then you are adding another source of complexity to the problem. And finally, in 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 our potential things to do, there are there is the the part of exploiting the topology of this large scale system in order to, 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 to become it at an extra degree of freedom in the, in the, in the seek of improving the performance of the closed loop system. I mean, you have the energy network, and then depending on the topology of the energy network, if you are, if you are going to, de to design the controller, perhaps you propose a particular scheme, a particular strategy, but what about the large scale nature and the way of splitting the problem into different and smaller problems? Something that, you know, conquer, divide and conquer is, is, is a premise that is, could be important. So let us think about this, this, this newer, a new aspect to take into consideration also within this approach. And then finally we say, okay, Given this, why don't we think about distributed algorithms in order to reduce the complexity in the management of these kind of systems, not only from the point of view of control, but also from the point of view of, of, of consequent aspects, such as communication, for instance. If you have huge communication among different subsystems within your system, of course, the computational burden will increase, and therefore, the final policy will be extremely complex. And then, Think about the way of managing with the consideration of couplings. You have a device, you have another device, this device, the device is producing energy, this device needs energy, so you need to interact among them in order to create this communication and then creating this communication, this self-providing uh, uh, of the resource you are considering in the problem, which is the energy, of course. If you produce more and you need more, therefore you can establish certain business among the different actors in this problem. With these ideas in mind, okay, our problem was clear, is the economic dispatch of large-scale energy systems. And notice that here, I could have here the, the, the energy work but you can replace this word by water, by gas, by transport, by other nature or kind of resource that could be sensible to be represented by large scale systems and that can be represented by these models following these topologies, for instance. Notice that we were discussing about non-centralized topologies. I am, I am not talking about distributed or decentralized topologies, given the differences among them. Notice that when you have a decentralized scheme, when you perform, when you design controllers, you say that once you split the system in different subsystems, every single individual subsystem manages its, pro, uh, its problems by its own, so you don't have any communication among the subsystem or mainly among the controllers. While if you have a distributed scheme, depending on the, of the topology of the network you, you, you are considering, you need to establish this communication, not only among the subsystems, so that it could be natural given the topology of the real plant, but also the communication among the controllers. So your policy shouldn't be unique. The policy should uh, look for information from the, its neighbors in order to decide, to, to make decisions locally. Therefore, the different topologies should be considered depending on the problem that you have in, in your hands. What is the advantages of this non-centralized approach with respect to centralized approaches? Something that is the natural way of controlling. Okay, you have the problem, you design the controller, no matter the problem was of large scale nature, 
and when you realize that perhaps you need flexibility. Imagine that you have a problem in a part of your system. The system is huge, and this problem makes that your system breaks down, and then all the system is off, is out of line, and therefore you are not able to continue working with the with the with the entire system. While if you split the system, perhaps if you have a fault, a problem in a, in a single device, you can isolate this part, and the rest of the system could go on with a policy taking into consideration that this part was disconnected, was completely unplugged. Something that is nice because you can play a bit with this kind of topologies in order to increase the performance in closed loop. Well, so this is our problem. Fantastic. The alternative was, okay, you have the energy network. Remember that you can replace this energy by other, 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 other nature of other, other type of system. Uh, of course, keeping the network concept behind, and then you have the, uh, the large scale system and the word partitioning. So partitioning and repartitioning. So you have the big system and you want to split with, with a criterion, the system into different subsystems. Notice that this is not a trivial part because you can say, okay, this, this set of devices go as a subsystem and then this other set of devices and so on. But you need to have something that motivates that this particular device belongs to the subsystem instead of belonging to a different subsystem, right? Not only given its own benefit, but also the benefit of all the systems and the global control objective that you have in your, in your network. Then, once you split a system, you want to start playing with these non-centralized control strategies or topologies in order to create a nice global and local strategies for managing, taking into consideration the nature of the problem, this disturbance rejection nature, and taking into consideration the constrained nature of everything and the other uh, non, let's say, technical control objectives that you put in your recipe which are related to sustainability, climate change, footprint, uh, carbon footprint, eco-friendly, whatever, etc., etc., etc. So these two actors will play with this energy network. Therefore, what is our proposal? Okay, notice that our proposal was okay, fantastic. You have the network, you split it up in a way. You have different parts, but that is the first concept I am going to introduce today, that is the self-sufficiency. Why don't we create these partitions, these subsystems, these sub-networks in such a way that it's, this network was self-sufficient, so I am able to produce the same amount or more energy with respect to the energy I need to cover, or I need for covering the load of my clients, of my consumers. Right. So notice that once you have this term, you have a clear criterion for proceeding. And then the second objective is, okay, once you have the different subsystems, I want to design the control policy, but not instead of designing one control policy for the entire system, I design several control policies or several controllers, each, each of them related to each of the resultant subsystems. And then notice the picture, notice the, this, this scheme that perhaps at this moment I have this partitioning and then I repartition, I perform a repartitioning, I have a different system. So what for? Perhaps if I have a time instant time, T, sorry, T1, this is the, my, 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 the, the most suitable way of splitting the system in order to reach a nice performance with my control strategy. But suddenly something changes, mainly these exogenous uncertainties or endogenous, endogenous, of course, because perhaps you have modeling problems or some other parameter or lacks in, in system identification. But mainly remember that this is a disturbance rejection problem. So the uncertainty comes from the, this, the external exogenous uh, disturbances. So it's more convenient right now in, in a time instant T2 to have this topology for splitting the system and therefore for performing the control design. When I talk about partitioning and when I talk about non-centralized control, optimization-based control, if you want to say, I must confess that once you, you, you look at the, by, um, look at the uh, literature, uh, the, most of the reported works say, okay, Assuming this partition for this large scale system, then we propose this non-centralized control policy or this, this non-centralized control strategy. 
We don't assume we have the partitioning. We perform the partitioning and we include the way of partitioning my large scale system into the control tasks. Therefore, you are gaining a degree of freedom in the way of performing the control and in order to, to reach a successful uh, closed loop control system. Therefore, given those or given yeah, these ideas, notice that our method is based on event triggered repartition schemes. So the, the possibility of changing the way of splitting the system into subsystems conveniently. And then once you split, you design the non-centralized economic dispatch, but again, using something that is well known in the literature, so it's not my contribution or our contribution, that is the coalitional base control. And you will see why I am going to introduce the coalitional base control, because at the beginning you say, okay, I am self-sufficient as a microgrid, fantastic. So I, I am able to manage my own um, um, consumption of energy in this, in this, in this particular case, given that I am able to produce my, my own energy and I cover the consumption or in, in, in over, I am able to produce more energy. And in case I have energy storage systems, I can save storage, store my excess of energy and perhaps I won't need more energy later on. So this is the proposed method. Therefore, sorry for my introduction, but very brief, in very briefly, I am going to talk about these three things. The problem, I, I am going to explain very fast the problem statement for you, for those of you that are not familiar with the energy problem, the, the dispatch, energy dispatch problem, economic dispatch problem. And then I am going to state or, or propose the, the control problem formally and the way of solving the problem from a centralized perspective. Then I am going to briefly explain my proposed solution or our proposed solution from the point of view of partitioning, repartitioning, non-centralized control, and coalition control as well. With a very, very concrete slide, because it's one slide presenting the case, okay, two slides presenting the case st uh, study and the main results, I am going to motivate you or, or, or to, to show the particular advantages of using our proposed uh, approach. And then uh, you, you realize perhaps from an intuitive point of view, why this approach could be uh, potentially applied. In fact, we are talking with some uh, people in Chile, given that they have huge systems, energy systems, and that we want to test our approach in the reality because in simulations is fantastic. And from the scientific point of view, our fantastic is 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 quite nice result, or there are, there are quite nice results, and we are happy with our approach. Well, the first thing, the problem statement. In in single words, or in simple words, better said, uh, we consider that our network. Uh, we are, we are not considering our network from the point of view of devices. We are considering the network from the point of view of nodes, and every single node could be. Um, uh, energy storage system or could be a producer or could be a, con a consumer. Therefore, we are going to talk about the power dispatch or the power balance of this network, energy network in this case. So the one of the easiest representation for this kind of networks is from the point of view of graphs. So we define graphs where every single uh, node is, 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 a, is one of these devices that I previously described, we are going to call them e buses. And then the communication among them is are the, the so popular lines, right? So you, you you transmit or you transport the energy from one device to the other, to the next device. And uh, then you establish an interconnection of devices according to the particular topology. So at this point, you have the very basic power balance equation that is, OK, I produce with, with this description. I have a dispatchable unit, so something that you can control the way of dispatching the energy or the power in this case. I have the power, sorry, the generation, the, uh, the storage unit, depending on the nature. I have uh, the, the main grid, something that is important in case you wouldn't be able to produce the, enough energy to cover your demand. So the grid is the last resource, but this is a resource. I say the last resource because it's the most expensive resource. And then 
you have different bosses. So you have the balance as you create a water balance, a thermal balance, a work balance, a mass balance. You have here the power balance, right? But the particular of the power balance here in this case that you have the disturbances we were talking about, the disturbances is a is a is just uncertainty depending not only of the production of energy from non uh, from renewable sources, but also of the consumption. And then nothing, nothing. Note that not only you you should not only consider the power balance equation that is a simple equation, but also the different coupling constraints. Notice that if you have a device and you are sharing uh, or negotiating the transmission of this power, this energy, the, the amount of energy that you are producing and you want to transmit, let's say transmit, that you send to the next node, to the next bus, is the same quantity that this bus will receive. Otherwise, there is an imbalance in the network and something strange is happening in the transmission line, something that in the reality happens. But we are not considering this detail of modeling in our case, right? So having this in mind, this, this kind of, of model, so we proceed with the formulation of the typical formulation of an optimization-based problem in order to solve the, 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 uh, the, the dispatch problem in turn. So you say, okay, you have the policy for managing this, this suitably managing this power exchange. You say, okay, you want to minimize the power quantity that you are exchanging, taking into consideration certain, certain policies. Notice here, there is a policy that you put here in the minimization in this optimization problem, subject to the local constraints given by the single devices. For instance, you are not able to produce more than certain amount of power and you have a minimum power that you should produce. For instance, in fuel cells, it's quite typical that you keep keep working the fuel cells, the fuel cell. Otherwise, you need another different process in order to cover the transient state before operating the fuel cell, the fuel cell properly and produce energy. So you have different uh, local, <coughs> sorry, local constraints. Sorry, one second. And again, you should take into consideration these coupling constraints that are given by the fact that you have an, a network, that you have a graph, and the edges should be considered for communication among the nodes. Okay. Here, I don't have any particular uh, cost function. I have the typical cost function from books. I remember that you can rewrite this cost function properly in order to include the uh, control objective that you wish. In principle, of course, taking into consideration the structural optimization problem and, all, and other topological rules that you should include when you create this kind of, of, of controllers. And then you have different aspects. Sorry, you have different uh, variables, uh, the optimization variables, uh, disturbances, links, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to state this problem. So the first assumption is that this problem will be feasible from the centralized, the centralized point of view. So you are considering here all the network in this optimization problem. And it's feasible, this optimization problem, because remember that this problem is a disturbance, disturbance rejection problem. If you are able to cover the demand, the energy demand, your problem is feasible, right? So how your problem is feasible? Or in, in, in which moment your problem is feasible? First, when you produce more than you consume. And second, if you have your that producing the energy, which is the, 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 the grid, the electric grid. You are not able to produce with electric, with uh, renewable resources or with your local resources. You call daddy and you say, hey, please send energy so you, I am able to cover the demand. This is the statement. So this is something that is huge, could be huge, depending on the scale of the problem, depending on the number of nodes, depending on the number of edges, this, this graph, and the optimization-based control behind the MPC problem, if you are able to have information for using the predictive capabilities in case. If not, you have an optimization-based control problem and then you solve the problem. Notice that this is a, a dynamic strategy or the, the, the computation of the, the, the control law is dynamic, depends on the solution of an optimization problem, depending on the technique, the, uh, the nature, the dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So this problem is well known that it's difficult to solve no matter 
that the system has a huge time constant. So you have perhaps here 10 minutes sampling time. In a water system, you can have one hour, two hours sampling time. Therefore, there are no, there are no challenges, huge challenges for the current technology in computation in order to compute in turn the potential solutions coming from the, the from the or the, the potential control loads coming from the solution of these optimization problems. Well, but the, it was not our aim. Our aim was to say, okay, we have clear that we have a large scale problem. Uh, it could be represented by this graph. The system is difficult to to, to manage given the um, the nature, the large scale nature. Therefore, I want to pro, uh, to design given the advantages of these optimization based strategies. Uh, the advantages of these strategies I, I want to use uh, for con taking into account constraints, taking into account the speed forward capabilities of uh, including the disturbances, model of disturbances, forecasting of disturbances in order to perform this disturbance rejection solution. Uh, if I have powerful numerical solvers, okay, fantastic. You can more or less ensure the factibility. And of course, you have other conditions that ensure the factibility of the optimization program, then the stability of the control loop in this in this framework. So, okay, fantastic. You have the problem. Now our goal is to solve this problem in a different way and yet in a convenient way, taking, to, taking into consideration the large scale nature. So our solution is, okay, we want to solve the problem from a non-centralized way. So we can or we would use a distributed topology or a decentralized topology, either distributed or decentralized topology. Then we want to use the partitioning, the time bearing partitioning approach. So not only partitioning, the, performing the partition of the network and then design controllers and go ahead. No, we want to, uh, to perform the partitioning, compute conveniently the controllers. If the system would perform in closed loop better with this partition, with the newer partitioning, then with the previous partitioning, we, we launch the, uh, the procedure of repartitioning, and then we solve the control problem, hoping that we have better results. So we need to ensure the conditions in which this statement will be held. The descomposition of this system, notice that I, I introduced before the self-sufficiency concept. So, we are going to say, okay, how I can perform the partitioning? Ah, because this is blue and this is white. No, I I, I need to 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 create sets or microgrids or sets of microgrids or sets of devices, energy devices, with a policy, clear policy. And notice that intuitively we want to to have a set of devices and loads in such a way that this set could be self-sufficient. So that this set of production devices could produce energy for this set of consumption devices. So you have a prosumer, a nice prosumer that will be able to be self-sufficient. Okay, but what happens if you are not able to reach the self-sufficiency feature? Okay, so you have the possibility of combining in a different way, creating coalitions. Coalitions from the point of view that I, if I have an energy community here, this is something that has devices, of course, has nodes and so on. But if you are able to, to share some devices with another microgrid or energy community, or in fact, you can put all together these two energy communities in order to cover the, the demand, the local demand, or you need to communicate the, um, the lack of energy to other energy communities, you need to create an, a smart strategy for performing this kind of decision or making this kind of decisions. So notice that here, using the self-sufficiency, we are going to, re to, to perform the repartitioning. So notice that partition is something dynamic, no, dynamic, time varying. So can vary a long time. Well, given this idea or with this idea in mind, I want to introduce the definitions. Please try to, 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 to avoid the mathematical definitions. I want to describe the, the conceptual definitions of the of the following things in order to then create the approach or, or describe our proposed solution. The first thing, over non-overlapping partition. The first question is, what is this? And why you should ensure this feature in the network? Okay, we want to say, okay, if you have different systems, uh, that you have the system of systems, you want to separate or you split, and this 
new topology with these splitted, uh, splitted subsystems, none of these devices could be shared among two subsystems. This is a premise in our approach. Of course, it could be attacked in a different way or supposing they are overlapping, but it implies a very a more complex approach. So right now is okay, you separate or you group up all the devices in different sets with null intersection. Then you talk about power imbalance. Okay, if I have this group of devices or this microgrid or this group of microgrids, if this what happens with the production with respect to the, uh, the with the consumption? Okay, if you produce more than you you consume, you say okay, my imbalance is positive, so I I have no imbalance. But if I consume more than I produce, I my imbalance appears. So I need more from external sources. Right. The next and natural concept is the self-sufficiency. Okay, I have this condition here. So my imbalance, my imbalance by convention in our problem is negative or is non-positive, particularly. I would say that my system is self-sufficient. Notice that I include the case of equality here because you don't know whether uh, you, you are in a marginal stability, let's say. And therefore, you are, you, you are not able to guarantee that with a perfect balance, you move towards the, the imbalance or the positive balance or the relax, let's say. So I, I, uh, we, we, we consider this concept in this way. Then imbalance, imbalance cost. This imbalance cost is, the, is, is, is one of the, now, the new terms in the cost function that I am going to implement later on for the statement of my op optimization problem, right? And then I am, I am penalizing my local imbalance in some way, taking into, consider into consideration that the system is split in subsystems, right? And then the efficient cost. These two costs will allow me later on to, to decide whether or not I, I perform partitioning, I perform repartitioning, I put this small device in this microgrid instead of in this other microgrid. I group these microgrids in a coalition or not. I keep independent the, 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 micro, the microgrids in this case, the subsystems. So these are the terms in the cons function that allow will allow me to make decisions with respect to the partitioning and therefore the control, right? And here in this efficiency cost, I will take into consideration not only the cost of the uh, of local, oh sorry, this is cost. This is the local, and this is the transmission, the energy or power transmission among different microgrids, among different trans uh, partitions. So if I am able to penalize the movement and imbalance and the movement, let's say, uh, yeah, the movement of, of of devices among coalitions or partitions, uh, I I will have criteria for for performing the approach. Well, assumption. It's not overlapping, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, overlapping partition. So in order first to split the problem in different sub-problems towards attacking the non-centralized control scheme, my first assumption is, okay, there is there is a non-overlapping overlapping set of connected, connected microgrids. I should ensure the connectivity. Otherwise, I, am, I, won't, be, I won't be able to send and receive energy for my neighbors. So this is important. With this assumption, notice that the optimization problem related to my repartition is, is okay. I have a criteria or a set of criteria for minimizing the, let, let's say, the chaos when I create the different subsystems. So I don't want to have a lot of uh, shared links in my graph. So I am minimizing the sharing of of, of power. And I am minimizing the movement of different components among microgrids, among coalitions. This is a basic perspective to say, okay, I want to balance the nature of my subsystems I, once I split my system. If I have a subsystem with one element and tons of connections with respect to another subsystem that has the rest of, sub, of, of elements with few interconnected links, I have an unbalanced topology of nodes and edges. So in this sense, I want to produce as a result a balanced topological set of subsystems. Right? Well, 
But remember that this is performed once at the beginning in order to start, but I need also to relaunch the repartitioning procedure if I need it. Imagine that you are working and given the uncertainty of the signals, external signals, you are not able to cover your demand, you need to reorganize everything. So, hey, this consumer is asking me for more energy. Suddenly, I need to reorganize everybody here in order to put more production there, in order to reconnect this, perhaps the energy storage system to this part, not only because of the amount of the energy this consumer needs, but also mm, for the nature of this consumption, perhaps this very instantaneous consumption, no, is 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 well kept along the time. Okay, uh, depends on the nature. So you need to reorganize. That's a that's a the origin of the repartitioning procedure. So you have the way of partitioning. You want to you need to repartition, and the repartition is given by the self sufficiency, right? So. If in your case, you are splitting the system, all the subsystems are self-sufficient, and you penalize the movement of elements among the subsystems, given my uh, my uh, my optimization problem for, for having the partition, once you have it, you need to check whether or not all these subsystems are self-sufficient. If they are all self-sufficient, fantastic. They can live isolated, and they are covered, they are able to cover their own energy. But, if one, at least one of them, is not is non-sufficient, okay, you need to reorganize. And how you reorganize? Okay, you check whether or not all the mic all the partitions are self-sufficient. Notice that here I confused. I was confused about the term partitions or microgrids because at this moment I am I am going to associate the word partition to microgrids. So you say, my micro is self-sufficient, so my one micro is one partition. Beautiful. So you can have all decentralized. If one of them is not self-sufficient, okay, we reorganize. If you, you are able to keep some of them self-sufficient, they are able to perform or to, to, to be managed by decentralized topology, by centralized controllers in a decentralized topology. But if at least one is not able to cover the demand. Hey, help my friends, my neighbors should come here and, and it should help me in principle. And then you reorganize, right? If you don't have any non-self-sufficient microgrid, okay, fantastic, you keep going. So you don't need to launch the process of partitioning, something that is a, a, is, is a big contrast with respect to other words that report that you have a period for, for checking the the repartition or the partition, and then every day or every month or whatever you want, you perform the partition. No, here, if you don't need to, you, if you need to do nothing, fantastic. Okay, so the main idea of the repartitioning is you move conveniently devices, you move either devices or microgrids to help, right? This is algorithm is based on a previous work with other people in other colleagues in, in, in Delft, in Netherlands, and it will structure the way of performing partitioning. Notice that this algorithm is completely, completely transversal for large-scale systems. It's not particular for energy systems. Uh, the aim, the goal, having a distributed method, notice that here I am using distributed, in order to reduce computational burden and in order to reduce the communication that you require for uh, establishing not only the policies, but also the, 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 the concrete solution of the problems given the transmission of power. Okay, what do you want with the repartition procedure? Having a non-overlapping, connected, and locally optimal part set of partitions, set of subsystems. Here I add this concept of locally optimal because now I want a, a subsystem that I, you, I want a subsystem that I can manage by its own with a decentralized scheme, so isolate. Notice that this is our procedure, the repartitioning procedure is an iterative procedure. And this procedure should have a maximum number of iterations. Otherwise, otherwise uh, given that it is able to move devices within the, the topology, so let's think about the graph and that you are able to move this node to here, to here, to there. Uh, you start moving this, these nodes and remember that this is an optimization problem. Perhaps you have a, a flat minimum and therefore, once you reach this flat minimum, you keep iterating t 
till infinity. So you need to establish a limit for uh, the number of iterations, right? So with this in mind, you perform something like this. You compute the different costs. You see what is the possibility of moving one element. And then you check the self-sufficiency. If the self-sufficiency is not rich, then you move another element. This element should be a neighboring, a neighboring element. You are not able to take an element far away from your, from your microgrid. So the nature of having a microgrid here and an energy storage system. Uh, 100 kilometers away is, is not fair because the transmission losses uh, would be huge. So this is uh, topologically impossible from the electrical point of view. So the algorithm takes into account all these particular features and at the end will yield with a set of self-sufficient self -sufficient subsystems. In principle, self-sufficient set set of self-sufficient microgrids, right? Okay, so you iterate and at the end, you have this, 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 the, the, the subsystems. Notice that once you have the self-sufficient systems, uh, the system is ready to be controlled in a non-centralized way. So different subsystems, all self-sufficient, I design the different strategies, local strategies. Remember that if your microgrid is self-sufficient, decentralized control, but, if your system, your subsystem, has two or more microgrids, you start negotiating the sharing of power among them. Therefore, you need to create a controller or control topology able to play with sharing variables and negotiations. And this is the distributed topology. So notice that in this case, this subsystem has a distributed control, while the other subsystems have, have decentralized control. That's why at the beginning I was talking about non-centralized control strategy, strategies because notice that simultaneously you have decentralized and distributed controllers playing the game in the same uh, whole subsystem, whole energy network, energy system. So you have this in this way. This is what I said. And once you have this clear in your mind, the, the fact of merging these microgrids are not able to be set sufficient, sorry for this typo, uh, then if not, you play with coalitions, coalitions of microgrids forming a subsystem. Right? Uh, then notice that, that now you are able to, to uh, instead of defining microgrids, you define coalitions, and then you are in the same way as at the beginning. Hello. You perform the algorithm that I won't explain given the time, and then uh, the result of this algorithm is a set of controllers, either of the centralized or distributed nature, managing every particular single particular subsystem of the big system. Notice that now we have a limit again of iterations, but now is not given by optimal potential optimal minima but for the number of subsystems. So now I need to design, if you have the system splitting four subsystems and you have five microgrids, it means that perhaps you have one, 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 and two, or the, the, distribu the suitable distribution. So you need to, con to design controllers for this finite number of subsystems. Once you have the subsystems, you perform a controller of this way, a, a, a practical controller, which has behind an optimization problem of this nature. Notice that this is the, uh, the control for every single subsystem and then taking into consideration the initial coupling, uh, local coupling here given by this constraint. But now this intercoupling or this, this, this uh, dependency of not only microgrids, but also clusters or coalitions. So the problem gets bigger in the sense of the controller, but notice that this is a problem of problems. You can solve it in parallel, and every single problem is either distributed or decentralized. Notice that here, the, the constraints are local, as the, here it says, and local in the, are local, so no, 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 uncoupled, uncoupled, coupled in the sense of microgrid, and coupled in the sense of subsystems. It appears another level of complexity. 
So from the point of view, decentralized at each coalition, you have this, right? And then you, if you have all the partitions, all the subsystems as microgrids in your energy system, you are able to, sorry, oops, uh, sorry, this is decentralized, sorry. As a um, microgrid, a subsystem, but, or a coalition in this case, but if a coalition has more than one microgrid, you have a distributed problem. And notice that if you are not able to solve the problem because you need to exchange uh, power among all the microgrids, you solve the problem in a distributed scheme. So you don't need to think about the centralized scheme. You can use the, the, the distributed scheme and then you start negotiating among microgrids or coalitions. So you, you will never have the centralized problem. So the worst case is fully distributed scheme. My example, very simple example, is this well-known, uh, well-known, sorry, um, network. It is a benchmark uh, uh, available in the literature and well used by the Power System Society in IEEE. Uh, this system has or is composed of uh, distributed generation units. Uh, dispatchable generators and storage, uh, storage units with these parameters, with these parameters of simulation. So notice that here the sampling time is 15 minutes, you know. Uh, therefore, we were able to see in a prediction horizon the potential dynamics and disturbances two hours, two and a half hours ahead in time. And we have this parameter that is the the trade-off, I didn't mention, I'm sorry, I, the, the trade-off in the partitioning problem among the, uh, the, the local balance, this imbalance, and this exchange of power balance. So you have different tuning parameters that allow you to have different performances in closed loop. Not only the, the, the tuning, the fine tuning with respect to local objectives, but also the tuning of the partitioning, optimi the optimization problem related to partitioning within the multi-objective optimization problem behind the control scheme, the predictive control scheme. With this benchmark, notice that this is my unique slide of results, and I want you to know to notice nice results in this case. Notice that if you imagine that you have here 24 hours, this is the simulation, the simulation period, and given that you have sampling time of 15 minutes, you have this scenario along the day from the midnight to midnight next day. And notice that the consumption in general of energy is less during the night, and there are peaks in the, during the day, depending also the seasonality, depending on the place in the, the world, uh, depending on the different factors. But in general, during the night, you don't need to supply a lot of energy or a lot of uh, quantity of energy. So you have here that in this case, you have a fully decentralized scheme because you now you have the number of microgrids in each coalition is one, one, one. So you have in this case eight microgrids. You have you have eight coalitions. You have fully decentralized problem, and this is the the number of different coalitions, right? Number of microgrids per, per coalition. Notice that in this at this moment you have perhaps two microgrids in one coalition, but mostly decentralized scheme. So you have seven decentralized controllers and one, or six decentralized controllers and one distributed controller in your topology, distributed predictive controller in your topology. Again here, perhaps this, there was a peak, I don't know, depending on the, the disturbance scenario. And then during the day, okay, now I need to cover the consumption and suddenly you need to have more microgrids per coalition. So you have here less number of decentralized controllers and more distributed controllers. And then therefore you have noticed here five, up to five microgrids per coalition here, up to four, and here up to eight. So notice that here the network is managed by one distributed predictive controller instead of eight decentralized predictive controllers, decentralized predictive controllers at this moment in time. And then once the peak is reduced, then you recover the original stage of the, of the manipulation of, of the management of the network. 
and here is noted by the number of different coalitions. Noted that here there is an, uh, one coalition, so one coalition including eight microbits. How you realize your system is performing properly? From the optimization based control point of view, one of the main key performance indicators is the amount of the cost function. So we compute the cost function when you solve the centralized, the centralized predictive control, the predictive control scheme, or there's a, you solve the problem from the, or from the centralized point of view, we compute the cost function when you solve the problem with our approach, and we compute the solution when we solve the problem with coalition, but without coupling constraints. It's another measure. <coughs> All right. And then we realize that the approach or the solution is quite similar, or at least that our, our proposed solution was bounded by the other solutions. They're fully decoupled, so the coalitions with no communication, uh, no matter they are uh, controlled by distributed control, something that is important to highlight, they're fully centralized and our approach. And notice that you, what you want is to have the, the closest solution with respect to the centralized approach, because most of the time the centralized approach is the most optimal approach, or will give the most centralized, uh, most optimal solution. So it validates this 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 plot or this evolution of the cost functions validates the suitability of our approach. So concluding briefly, concluding my my talk, uh, I, I want to highlight that. Our approach is based on non-centralized predictive control. You can keep, you can withdraw, you can drop the, the part of, of predictive. You can say optimization based, no, no matter the, the use of a, a prediction. Of course, you need to use prediction where this is, this is, this is possible to be used or, this is, or, or it, it adds advantages. Otherwise, you use optimization based, mainly because the fact of including uh, constraints include the possibility of having a recomputed control uh, low at every single time instant along the simulation scenario. And in our case, was applied in this, in this important problem, a uh, focus on system of systems or uh, critical infrastructure systems. There are the several uh, appealing words, appealing keywords for uh, identifying these problems. We use or we propose the time varying capability of splitting the system into, into some systems, adding another degree of freedom in order to increase the performance of the closed loop control topology, something that in general is not performed. So partition is, partitioning is unique, and then you won't use partition anymore for improving the performance of the system. Uh, the result and the composition could be uh, used for either distributed or decentralized control topologies instead of purely centralized. Our approach was bounded or the suboptimality was bounded. Therefore, we can at least in simulation ensure that it works properly with respect to a centralized solution, which is the most optimal from the numerical point of view, but perhaps is not the most optimal from a modularity point of view, computational point of view, other aspects, etc. Notice that with this kind of non-centralized topology, we can decrease the burden of communications or the, the communication burden, something that is fantastic when you have a very, very, very really huge large scale system or when you have no so very um, powerful devices for computation. So you try to reach at least the online application or real time, hopefully real time application. There are many things to do. There are many things to potentially change in order to improve our algorithm, our proposal. So in order to, to improve, could be combining the, could be the, the fact of combining the, the suboptimality explicitly, combining the, the, the measure of suboptimality in the cell sufficiency, because you perhaps remember that if it works, please do not breathe. So if things are okay, perhaps no matter the, the you raise the flag of repartitioning, the manager could, would say, no, 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 keep this unbalance because this unbalance could be managed given the answer, the local uncertainty, you know, the, the disturbance uncertainty, you know, the local uncertainty given by the modeling of their devices or the, uh, the uh, other local aspects of the lower level of control. 
So you don't need to launch the, the repartitioning. You want to partition, but you don't want to keep repartitioning for a, perhaps a, a particular phenomenon, etc. Sorry? Sorry? Are, are, are you talking? Are you talking to me? Carlos, uh, can we finish? Because we have... Yeah, um, I am in my, fin I'm, I'm my, my last slide. No worries. So there are other things that are very interesting in the analysis and so on. And one of the main analyses that we are going to face is the inclusion of evolutionary game theory for the solution of this kind of systems. Uh, all this work is compressed in different papers we were publishing and the uh, ongoing research uh, is reported in local, in local documents that if you are interested, you can contact me for information about these topics. So thank you very much. Sorry for the time. Uh, I was thinking that I was uh, five minutes late. But again, thank you for the invitation, and I hope you all find interesting my approach. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Carol, for your very interesting uh, presentation. We, we have time for one question. Any questions? If you have if you have questions, you can uh, provide me, and I can talk with Carlos uh, to answer your, your comments. Uh, thank you so much, Carlos, again for this very interesting plenary lecture. Thank you for your invitation. You can make questions by the chat. You need any things. Mm -hmm. And after that, they can be responded. Thank you, Professor Carlos Ocampo, by your plenary lecture. Uh, very interesting topic. Thank you. It's my pleasure.